afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to be talking about back pain today, which is a major problem for a lot of people. And today we have with us a guest presenter, Paisley Hardman Oaks, who is a doctor of physical therapy from the University of Utah, who actually, well, she graduated from the University of Utah. She actually works for In Motion Physical Therapy currently. So we're glad to have her here and glad that you've joined us. So we'll give the mic to Paisley. Hi. So today we're going to be talking about a few things. We're first going to educate you about spine and low back anatomy, common injuries related to the spine, prevention ideas to help keep you from getting low back pain. We're going to help you identify when you need professional assistance and also to help you identify some treatment options if you are already experiencing low back pain. Some general info is that Americans spend at least $50 billion each year on low back pain between treatments and medications and other things. Low back pain is the leading cause of disability in the United States. Low back pain is one of the most common non-malignant, so non-cancer, reasons for prescribed opioids, which right now with our lovely opioid crisis, this is something people are starting to take note of that maybe treating with these is not the best option for low back pain. Some contributors to low back pain are obesity, poor posture, lack of exercise, poor sleep, improper lifting, stress, occupational hazards such as heavy repetitive lifting tasks, smoking, pregnancy, trauma, poor nutrition, medications, aging, and sports. Nearly two-thirds of Americans experience low back pain. However, 37% don't seek professional help for pain relief, according to the American Physical Therapy Association. So that could mean a couple of things. First of all, that most people don't actually need a lot of professional assistance in order to help relieve their pain, or that people just don't even know where to go to get help for that pain. Some common back pain myths and misconceptions are, because I have low back pain, I should avoid working. Most commonly, we actually like you to keep working as much as you can without increasing your pain. It helps to decrease that risk for disability long term. Next, because I have back pain, sitting and resting will make me feel better. Certain back injuries, such as disc injuries, actually prefer standing and walking around. That will help relieve your pain better than sitting. Because I have back pain, I will always have back problems. I commonly see people who have short two-week back injuries that quickly resolve and they never have to deal with it again. Because I have an MRI that shows injury, I will always have pain. This is also not true. I have a lot of people who show very severe things on their MRIs but actually report no pain. I have a lot of people who have MRIs that don't show anything and are in severe pain at that moment because of what they have going on. So that leads into the next one. An MRI CT scan will always help me identify why I'm having pain and I should get one as soon as possible which also, again, isn't true because sometimes we actually need to do the treatments first. We can save ourselves a lot of money and frustration getting an MRI that's not going to show any injury to the back tissue. Uh, the next one, more the most effective treatment for low back pain is pain medication. We've already discussed this. They are trying to figure out other ways besides using opioids for pain management. Pain medications also just take the edge off the pain and they don't actually go in and help resolve what might be causing that injury in the first place. So a lot of that's just covering up the problem in a sense. And last, an injury to my back will cause pain in my back. Occasionally I have people with severe injuries that are actually causing pain down their legs, no pain in their back, but it's actually coming from their back and they get confused by that. So I like you to understand that could be going on. Some common diagnoses, diagnoses and injuries to the spine. I've listed quite a few of them here. Some of the ones that people don't really understand are lumbago. Basically, that just means low back pain. Uh, we differentiate between acute, chronic, and recurring back pain. Acute is usually lasting less than three months. 
chronic is lasting more than three months. Recurrent just means lots of different injuries that lead up to your pain. Stenosis is actually a narrowing of the holes around our nerves, and so that can come through arthritic changes and some other types of injuries. Sciatica, we always talk about that as being that general pain down the legs that shoots down, but there are more distinguished nerve pains that we can decide on. Um, some of these other ones people are more commonly knowing. Spondylolisthesis is an actual slipping of your spine forward. There's usually little breaks in the spine that are causing that kind of damage, and that one is a little bit more of a serious concern and definitely needs some professional help that way. So commonly when we look at it from a physical therapy perspective, we are looking at damage to the mechanical structures in your back. A lot of these structures are your discs, your vertebra, your facets, or the joints of your back, the ligaments, the fascia, the muscles, and the nerve. So we're going to do a quick little anatomy lesson so that you understand a little bit more about what those different structures are. First of all, the vertebra. That's the actual bones of your spine. Common things that get injured with this are stenosis. We talked about the narrowing of the holes in the spine. Arthritis, which is what OA stands for. Facet impingement. That is the joints of your spine getting jammed together for whatever reason and causing irritation to that joint. Our ligaments that actually connect bone to bone. A lot of times this is considered a lumbar sprain if we get an injury to that. Common ways are through car accidents and twisting injuries. Our tendons, which connect muscle to bone. Some of these injuries are the repetitive overuse type of injuries. Our fascia, which surrounds all of our different tissues. It's that connective tissue that holds us all together. So it covers our nerves, muscles, tendons, blood vessels, and pulls it all in. Commonly injury-wise for the low back, we're dealing with the thoracolumbar fascia. I will show you a picture of that and why that's so important. Our muscles, which contributing factors there are our flexibility of our muscles, the strength of our muscles, and the general motion that our muscles allow us to do. Commonly, as far as flexibility, we're talking about hamstring, hip flexor, and piriformis flexibility when it comes to low back. Strength size, we're talking a lot about core strength, which I'll actually discuss in just a few minutes. Nerve pain, typically with the nerves in our back, we're dealing with terms like sciatica. Um, our stenosis also tends to lead to more of a nerve-related pain. This is where the sensation of our back comes from and the motor control or that sense to our muscles to tell us to move coming from the brain is coming through our nerves in our back. The discs in our back are actually the cushions between our spine. So we talk a lot about disc herniations, bulges, ruptures, those terms. But they are also helping to cushion us as we put impact down through our spine. Quick picture of the spine so that you can understand a little bit more about the vertebrae. C1 through C7 is your neck. That part, if you hear terms on MRIs or imaging that say you have a C6 injury. They're counting down from that C1 down to the level 6, and that's where your injury potentially is at. Then we have our thoracic spine. That's where your back starts to curve the opposite direction, and that is T1 through T12. We also have our ribs that connect into this thoracic spine area and can factor into pain in that location. We have our lumbar spine, which is L1 through L5. And we have our sacrum and coccyx, which are more or less fused bones. And so they don't have as much movement, but we still distinguish them out in their own separate levels because there are nerves that come out at each of those levels. When we go over the general vertebra shape, this is actually from your neck. So this is one of your upper neck vertebrae that we're showing a picture of. We have our body of the vertebra, which is right here. That's the front of the spine. This part, the back of the spine, is where you feel the pointy part when you run your fingers along your neck. Then we have the different 
facets or articular processes. These are the joints of the spine that allow it to move back and forth, side to side, rotate. We have these holes. Spinal cord comes through this hole. Your other nerves can come through these other holes. You actually have nerves that come from the spinal cord out through this little space as well, if my pointer will move. This little space as well, the nerve comes through there. So when we're talking about stenosis, it's actually a narrowing in of those holes that causes pinching on the nerve itself. When we talk about the discs, they are actually in between the spine, sitting on top of the body right here, since my pointer's a little sensitive. So here we have some quick overview of the muscles in the back. We commonly talk about this one up here. This is your upper trap muscle. This is a common injury with whiplash. And so that's where we're looking a lot at this lovely kite muscle on your back. Often this muscle gets too tight. These muscles actually stop firing. And so that creates an imbalance and a lot of pain for people. This part we talked about before, that's that thoracolumbar fascia. It's basically a collection of all that tissue that surrounds everything, and it gets very thick right there. So it's actually harder to stretch in this area because of that tissue. It's not as pliable or as flexible as our muscles actually are. We have our long and straight muscles right here. They actually help us straighten up in our back. They're called our erector spinae. And we have pulled away a couple other layers, like our latissimus dorsi, or our lats, and a few other layers in there. Here we've broken it down to the very deep back muscles. So often when we're talking about low back injuries, it's actually injuries to these areas. So we have our deep, almost in our stomach area, this is your quadratus lumborum. It's a smaller muscle, but gets injured a lot with twisting injuries. We have our multifidi muscles, which are right along the spine right here. Those are designed to help your spine rotate and also help stabilize this side as your other side moves. And then again, we have our extensor muscles of our spine that lay over the top of those. So when we look at all of this anatomy, now we have to say, OK, what's the point of all of that? How do we try and keep ourselves from getting low back pain? And how does this anatomy help us understand our mechanics better, how to move differently to prevent injuries? Because prevention, in the end, is the best treatment. When we talk about prevention, some of the things we're looking at are strengthening, Cardio training, typically they recommend 30 minutes a day as far as preventing low back pain injuries. Correct lifting techniques, correct posture, strengthening, or excuse me, stretching and flexibility, good nutrition, sleep, stopping or reducing smoking, and limiting bed rest. I will be discussing a few of these categories, but not all of them. First one, strength. When we talk about trying to prevent low back pain, we talk a lot about core strengthening. A lot of my patients don't really understand what this means, so I thought I'd explain it. I like to think of it like a big box. We've got the top of our core is our diaphragm that sits right underneath your rib cage, and it helps us with breath control, but it actually also creates stability to the top of that box. The front of the box is our abdominals, and we definitely don't want to forget our transverse abdominis, which I will discuss in the next slide. We talk about our back muscles, so these are our extensors, those muscles that help us straighten up, the stabilizers and the rotators, so all those little tiny ones that we talked about on the sides of the spine. And all of those in the back also help to keep strength, especially as you are lifting and twisting. We've got the sides of our core, which is our oblique muscles. Commonly, we use our side planks to try and strengthen those. The one that's becoming a big subject in physical therapy are these lovely pelvic floor muscles. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those and how we can 
make sure we factor that in when we are doing our core strengthening. So the transverse abdominis. This is a muscle on the front of our stomach. It's deep inside there. So we often think about our rectus abdominis, which is your six pack. People think that to strengthen their abdominal muscles, they need to do crunches and sit-ups. And all those, those work one muscle, they don't actually work this one. And this one is a big part of supporting our low back, our spine. So we want to make sure we know how to activate it. The easiest way is to take your fingers and find the pointy part in the front of your hip and then just move your fingers slightly inside of that. When you pull in your belly like you're pulling on a tight pair of pants, you should feel that muscle come down away from your fingers and basically contract back and in. Almost like you're putting on a corset nice and tight, this muscle helps to hold and stabilize our low back. Our pelvic floor. So a lot of times in the past we haven't really discussed this, but there are muscles deep inside our pelvis area that do help support the core from below. So we've talked about kegels in the past with women who were pregnant, but now they are starting to incorporate these into general low back strengthening as well. So as you can see on this, there are a lot of little muscles deep in the bottom of our pelvis area. To activate them, we can Commonly, one exercise is to lie on your back with your knees bent and feet flat on the mat or bed. Contract our pelvic floor muscles as if you're holding back urine or holding back gas. And be sure to perform a full relaxation in between each contraction. So basically, I like to think of it like an elevator. I'm going to take those muscles and I'm going to pull them up and in nice and slow as if I'm raising the elevator up to the fifth floor and then slowly go back down all five floors. So I'm not trying to just squeeze tight and let go. I actually want to ease them up there and then slowly let them back out. The other thing I commonly see people do wrong is they actually tighten their bottom muscles instead. They don't know how to isolate these muscles out. The problem with tightening your bottom is that will also extend you and actually lean you backwards, which can cause problems to the low back. So. Now we're going to talk about lifting because that's great that we know how to strengthen our core and use our core, but we also need to think about that as we lift. So typical things to keep in mind, we want to make sure we're keeping the object close to our body. We want to lift with our knees. We want to ask for help if items are too heavy for us. And this is commonly one area that I see people for in physical therapy is they knew the item was too heavy, but they lifted it anyway because it was faster. Um, we want to make sure we're maintaining an active lifestyle so that we have the strength to lift the things that we need to. And we want to maintain neutral spine alignment. One other thing that I didn't put on here is actually that breath control as well. We talked about the diaphragm and how that's on the top of the core. If we breathe out as we lift objects, that will help us so that we don't over tighten up our abdominal muscles and so that our back will actually be better supported if we use that breath control to lift objects. So here I have a diagram of a gentleman lifting. He does pretty good with this. So he's keeping the object, first of all, if I can get my arrow to move. He has the box in front of him. He made sure to move his feet nice and close to the object. His body's nice and close. He's keeping his back straight. He's keeping his eyes up, which is a great way to help keep your back straight without overthinking it. He's not looking down at the box, which tends to make you a little top heavy. He's initially going to keep his arms straight, but as he brings this object up to closer towards his core or his stomach area, He's going to bend his arms and he's going to bring it in. As he lifts and turns, he's going to make sure it's nice and close to him. He's going to rotate through his feet, not through his back. He's actually going to step his feet around before he puts the object up on the shelf. Same thing in reverse. 
basically pull it in nice and close, bend through the knees, keep the back straight, keep the eyes up, and also make sure you keep breathing. Correct general standing posture. So here this gentleman actually does a little bit of an overcorrection, but initially we can all look at that and see this is not great posture. His head's forward, his shoulders are rounded forward, you can see his mid-back is extremely arched, and his low back actually looks pretty good. It's got a little bit of curvature, but not too much. If you looked at where his ears are in relation to his shoulders and his feet, they are obviously much more forward. In the long run, we like to think that we can draw a line straight down from his ear through his shoulder, down through the ball of his feet. He in this picture is leaning backwards slightly because you can see there's almost too much weight on his heels. I prefer pressure on the ball of his feet. And basically we want to think of this like stacking the blocks. If you think of a tower in your building blocks, if you put your head too far forward, it's eight to 10 pounds, all of a sudden that's gonna start to pull you forward as well. Commonly, what people don't realize is this part of their body is the most important part in keeping correct posture. If this part's tilted too far forward or too far backwards, your whole posture is going to be off. So you do want to make sure you have some curvature in your low back, but not to the point that you're letting your abdomen hang forward. We also want to make sure you don't overcorrect that and straighten out your spine completely. The common one, as far as work injuries go, are sitting at a desk. We talk about this posture a lot. So first thing I always look at is the monitor height. Make sure you position your monitor so that the top of it is in line with your eye height and it's tilted up slightly so that you only have to move your eyes to see the whole screen, not your whole head. Two. Look at your distance from the monitor. You should be sitting about a foot and a half or 18 inches from your computer screen. Elbows, arms and wrists. You wanna keep your elbows at your sides, your forearms par parallel to the floor. Then position your keyboard so that you can reach it comfortably without moving your elbows at all. I do have people who use wrist pads and those are fine as long as you've accounted for those when you're busy doing your posture check. Your back, you want to make sure you tilt your pelvis slightly forward. Again, we want that nice curvature of the spine, not too far forward that your belly is hanging out, but just slightly forward so that you're sitting on your hamstrings, which are your upper thigh muscles on the back, rather than sitting directly on your tailbone. Commonly, I see people sitting right on that tailbone, which also causes you to slouch. For your chair, um, we are okay with you using your chair's backrest. As long as you keep your pelvis tilted slightly forward, you shouldn't find yourself slouching into the back of your chair. If you do, please scoot forward a few inches so that you're not relying on that backrest in order to keep your posture correct. Number six, looking at your feet. Both of your feet should be flat on the floor. Sitting cross leg is a no-no for long extended periods of time as is sitting on one of your legs because both of those positions can actually cause you to get slouchy. I do this quite often. I am five foot one and so it's easy for me to start crisscrossing my legs and sitting on them and wondering why my posture is terrible. So if your feet can't reach the floor, see if you can spring for a foot rest or use a small box. We don't want that box to raise up so that your knees are above your hips that's too far up, but it should be about a 90-90 position between your hips and your knees to create the right position. The last thing that I always point out to my patients if they've had back pain or they want to prevent it is if you can, stand up and walk every 30 minutes. Our backs are not designed to be sitting the way that we do these days. So we need to get up and move. It doesn't need to be far, but it does need to be frequent our backs like movement. So this lady is just showing some of those different aspects. Notice her hips 
are at about 90 degrees. Think of that box angle right there. And then 90 degrees in her knees is about right. When we look at driving, the things that we are looking at here, we're looking at positioning ourselves properly in the seat. We want to sit as far back in the seat as possible, basically wedging our bottoms between the seat and the seat back. If we do use a back support, you still want to scoot your bottom back all the way before you ever place a backrest in there. I see a lot of people put the backrest down first, and unfortunately what that does is bring your hips forward and you are still allowed to slouch all you want. Not what we're going for here. So, that's the first aspect. Second, we want to adjust the distance between the seat and the steering wheel. So we're going to move our seat forward so that we can fully depress the brake and the clutch while keeping our knees slightly bent, about 120 degrees. So we talked about that 90 degree angle when sitting in a desk, this one we actually want a little bit bigger angle there. Number three, adjust the tilt of the seat. We want to tilt the seat forward or back until the legs, excuse me, until our leg from our hip to our knee is fully supported while the foot is on the gas pedal. So as much as possible, we want all of this supported by that seat. Next, we want to adjust the back of the seat. Our seat should be at an angle that is fully supportive of the length of our back, avoiding reclining too far back because that actually causes us to lean forward to look over the steering wheel and see what's going on on the road. And also avoiding to be too straight because then our elbows, knees, and hips also are bending forward. Next, we want to move the steering wheel. We want to make sure our hands reach the 10 and 2 position that we were all trained in driver's ed to do. Hers is actually a little off of there. We want to make sure that our arms are slightly bent. In my opinion, she is way too close to the steering wheel right here. Um, our hands should be just slightly lower than our shoulders. So if you look at that, that part of it, she's done pretty well. Last, we want to adjust the head restraint. We want to make sure the bottom of our head is level with, or sorry, the bottom of the head of the rest should be level with the base of our skull. So she's actually a little bit high compared to this specific headrest. Um, and we should be about an inch away from our head while we're driving. So we don't necessarily want to be leaning on this. A lot of our headrests these days do come out and actually poke forward a lot to try and help support our necks better. Unfortunately, not all of us are five foot six the way that the cars were made, and so this often actually pushes us so that we get that forward head positioning, and that can cause pain over time if we stay in that position. So because not all headrests are created equal for all of our different heights, we recommend you stay away from that headrest a little bit so that you can keep correct posture. So, then we look at posture with sleeping. As you can see, people sleep all different kinds of ways. So, general ideas for sleeping for better back alignment, which these do change slightly depending on certain back injuries, but prior to a back injury, we want to think one to two pillows under our legs, keeping our heels free floating. So we don't want pressure on our heels all night. That can cause sores to the back of our heels. Um, we want to make sure that if we do put a small towel roll underneath our back, that again, it's not under our bottom area. It is under the arch of our back, and it shouldn't be pushing us more forward than that natural curvature of our low spine. We want to avoid too many pillows under the neck. Um, Later I'll talk about this as well in, as far as pillows go, but if you do need three pillows or four pillows in order to breathe better at night, you want to make sure that's a gradual incline. So I always say start with your four pillows that you need under your neck, drop it down to two pillows under your mid-back, and potentially even all the way down to one pillow. So it's more of an inclined surface versus all of those pillows right underneath your neck. That can actually close off your airway as well, which isn't great for those who are trying to avoid breathing problems at night. 
Our side sleepers, typical thought is just placing pillows between the knees as far as low back pain goes. There are all kinds of pillows designed for the side sleepers as far as the neck goes, but right now we're mostly speaking about low back. For our stomach sleepers, we are going to typically want to put a small pillow underneath the stomach that maintains that correct alignment of the spine. If we lay on our stomach normally, we turn our heads to the side and we actually keep our back in an arched position all night long that's extended because the mattress does sink in a little. So then it ends up to be too much curvature in that spine all night. So a little pillow under the stomach can help that part. As far as mattresses and pillows go, for both areas, there isn't a perfect mattress or a perfect pillow for everyone. I get asked this commonly, what is your favorite mattress to tell people to sleep on? What is your favorite pillow? There's not really an answer to that. However, typically a medium firm mattress is best for those individuals with low back pain due to soft mattresses not giving us enough support. The other thing is, if your mattress is too old, it's not supporting you, so change it out. Typically, we talk about every eight to 10 years, more commonly depending on the mattress. Um, as far as pillows go, again, not a perfect pillow for everyone, but we do wanna avoid putting too many pillows directly underneath the neck. That can also cause issues to our low back due to positioning of the spine. So if you do need them, make sure you do it in a gradual incline. The pillows should also be changed more frequently than most of us do. They recommend every two to five years for most pillows. They also lose their support over time, even all your fancy ones. So then we're very quickly going to go into some different thoughts about treatment. If you do have low back pain, there's nothing wrong with thinking that you want to take care of it yourself. If your pain is less than five days, if it's mild to moderate intensity, then by all means, try and self-treat. Oftentimes we use icing, um, especially within the first 24 hours. We do gentle, light stretching, no extreme positions because that can cause more damage to certain areas of our back. We are okay with resting. However, I strongly recommend to not do full bed rest. Laying in bed all day causes other issues like pneumonias and pressure sores, let alone the fact that it actually makes your back and those muscles that have been injured tighten up more, and it will be more difficult to get yourself moving after that. We want to initiate a gentle walking program. This is another one that again, I say it doesn't need to be far, it just needs to be frequent. Get up and walking every half an hour minimum. If you have any low back pain, make sure you're getting up and getting walking, if you can tolerate it. Eventually, we do wanna progress back to a strengthening program as soon as that pain decreases and we feel confident to do so. However, if our back pain does last more than five days or is in severe intensity, we do recommend that you go see your primary care or your physical therapist to decide better treatment options for you. Please see your doctor immediately if you have any of the following. Legs giving way due to weakness, change in bowel or bladder control, unexplained weight loss or gain, fever, numbness in the groin or inner thigh. If you have any of those symptoms, please don't try to self-treat at that point. Some other treatment options that we have, we have physical therapy, acupuncture, massage therapy, chiropractics, self-care as we already spoke about. We can see our athletic trainers if we're younger athletes getting injured. We can potentially get pain medications through our doctors temporarily to get on top of that pain. We can get injections or surgeries in extreme cases. We can see pain management specialists that are designed to help manage that pain a little bit better for us. We can see personal trainers that may have some injury prevention training, uh, fitness instructors. We can also try meditation and relaxation techniques. Oftentimes these low back injuries are muscular. That is the most common reason for low back pain. So learning how to actually relax and de-stress can go a long way for getting your back feeling better faster. 
And this is my information, if anybody has any further questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Paisley, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And um, we'll see you next time.